All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to the 116th episode of The Get Down. My name is Kareem. Gary W. here. A little in person. We got a little in person pod this week. I was thinking before we uh, started recording that I always feel real strange doing this because I don't have headphones on. And you've been doing it with no headphones now for a little bit. Yeah. But me not, not having my headphones and like being in front of my computer feels really strange. Well, we record in a different format literally every other episode. It seems, it seems weird. It, se- it seems that since the 100th episode, it's been like that. <laughs> but so we're, we're coming work. off uh, last week where we, we talked a lot about like we started our, our pod with how to be a headliner. Right. And it, I think it went over really, really well. We got a lot of great feedback on, on last week's episode. So I think for this episode, it just makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about how to be uh, an opener. Yeah, this is something that you probably you've had a lot more experience with. Uh, you had a lot longer experience with it. Like I, over my DJ career, I've done a lot of uh, open to close sets. It's kind of what I was brought up doing. It's kind of how we did it. Um, and so having the the opener mentality was always different. And then like because I feel like I always just opened for myself. Right. Um, I feel like even now you prefer that. I still do because like it it lets me kind of just set the the table and set the mood and how. I want the night to go. Like, do I want to go huge from the get-go? Whatever. Yeah. But so at, starting out as a DJ, how did you approach opening uh, when you were opening for a bigger act? That's what I want to know. So do you mean like when I first started DJing? When you first started DJing, yeah. Because like I, I think that uh, you came into this industry as an opener. Right. Um, you know, you, you started your career at West five, right. I was being an op being like the house opener. I was lucky because I was doing, when I first started DJing, I was doing, uh, private events, backyard events, house parties, mostly doing stuff that I just wanted to do. And I got lucky to the point where someone heard me DJ a Super Bowl party in Hoboken in an apartment. And they happen to be a booker and a manager at a nightclub in Hoboken that no longer exists. So my first real opportunity working in nightlife was opening at a venue. And right. so I never had like the bar experience or, you know, that, that came second for me. Uh, so my, my mind state going into my first few times there was just like, can I bring a shitload of people to show right. them that I have pull and I have friends that are going to come out? Yeah. And just like, how can I use this to help me get into other venues and, and other uh, clubs and, and nightlife spots in and around Hoboken? So I think my approach as far as the music was more so like I was figuring out because I had never done it either. And it was like I was making mistakes. I'm sure I was playing songs that were way too big. Yeah. As a headliner, and uh, as an opener, and the headliners would come on and be like, "Cream, you probably shouldn't play that song. You probably shouldn't have done that." And that's how I learned. But I created a really good relationship with the venue, and I was bringing a lot of people out. And I think I did a pretty good job, other than maybe like that eleven thirty to twelve o'clock, where I kind of got a little ahead of myself. Right, type right. Thing. I, I think opening back then was a little different than opening now. I feel like opening now, you still need to bring energy and a lot of energy and but still stay away from those songs that you know the headliners going to get into yeah. um i feel like format post pandemic has changed a little bit where you're not kind of there's no really easing into the night anymore i don't feel i feel like it's it's got to be punchy and stuff that people know and like i said high energy but not overstepping your boundary whereas i feel like when we were on the come up like you can start to play like Back then, you'd play like maybe a little more tech house or like right. house house, like deeper house. You could play deeper, it. right? And and that's always how I would open for myself. Would Venues be don't want that anymore. No, that's gone. Like that's that's gone I by the way. That's a great point. The pandemic really brought that out, right? Where there was no like easing into a night. It was like, all right, all the tables are here, and this is who we got for the night. Like it's go time, even right. if it's ten o'clock or eleven o'clock. I so, prefer that format more to where you're 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 starting the night with energy. I mean, like. We all know that there's plenty of record pools out there. There's plenty of different um, genres that we can all get into. And there's plenty of different edits of all types of songs that you can really differenti- have a very differentiated set from the headliner and still be energetic. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, we've, we have, I have meetings every week for Birch is one of our big, you know, nightclubs that we book here. We have meetings every week. And one of the things that I just brought to all the DJs and especially all the openers was – 
you know, there is, you're an opener, but you're still, you know, setting a strong pace and we're playing up tempo and high energy music, just not the biggest records or the highest energy records. Right. So there's definitely been a, a shift. I think just us talking about this right now, it just accentuates the fact that I think being an opener is number one, the hardest job as a, as a DJ and number two, the most important. And oftentimes those DJs aren't paid to, to represent those two things, which yeah. is kind of crazy. It's, uh, it's, it is, it is one of the hardest jobs because to do it well, you, you almost have to be experienced, but experienced DJs aren't filling these slots because they don't pay because it doesn't pay. Right. So it's really a catch 22. And so to find a young up and coming DJ that can open a room well can be sh extremely beneficial. And I think we'll talk about a few of the things that you can think about as a young DJ on the come up in order to set yourself a little bit apart from uh, the average opening DJ. Yeah, I mean, let's run through the laundry list of things that you could do as an opener to set yourself apart. So first and foremost would be knowing the equipment that's in the venue. I think that's the most important thing when I talk to young DJs. It's like, hey, this is the equipment we have. Do you know how to use it? If you don't know how to use it, here are the days that you can go into the venue and bring your stuff and make sure you sound check and practice or whatever you need to do to be able to use that equipment. Uh, I think that's extremely important because venues aren't here to cater to you, the opener. They're catering to the headliner. And a headliner is going to want to use some probably CDJs and a 900 or an S11, one of, the, one of those setups. Right. So learn how to use that equipment because that's what's going to be in the nightclubs. I think while we're on the equipment talk, it's also un understanding the equipment to the point where when that when the switchover is ready to happen, that you can switch over to the headliner. We've talked about this in the past, but it is so, so important to make sure that you can set the headliner up and, and make sure that he's ready to go when it's time. Um, you don't want to be fumbling around, not understanding how to do that, because that can be a complete embarrassment, number one. And, you know, it's a great way not to get asked back. And yeah. it's also a great way to just really sour a potential relationship with that headliner. When I walk into a headline set or if I'm just getting ready to set up, some of the things that you as the opener that, that you can do to really make the headliner's life a lot easier and then also show the headliner you know what you're doing. So like Gary said, like, you know, you want to get your computer out of the way because the headliner needs to set up his or her computer. That's number one. So maybe it makes sense to have a USB stick loaded with a bunch of different songs and a bunch of different mixes. And as the headliner is about to go on, you transfer over to the USB, right? Because then that'll open up all the wiring. It'll get your computer out of the way. It'll open up the space for the headliner to set up his computer or her computer and plug in and be ready to go. Again, like as much as you are important in the night, it's the headliner show, right? People are sometimes buying tickets to see that person. Uh, the venue's paying that person a lot more money. They, they need to be happy in the eyes of the venue, right? So these are some of the things. Uh, and then as far as the music, like what are some ways that an opener can kind of leave the headliner off? Well, I think number one, I think what I get asked the most when I have an opener would be, where do you want to, where do you want to, you know, leave off, right? right? I think always extending that courtesy, number one, is very important, just, just in case they do want to start with like a 128, or maybe they want to start with a 70 BPM track. Like, right. you just don't know. So you want to be in a space where, you want to make sure that the, the headliner is in a space where they're comfortable with the transition. Um, I think that another one, I mean, a lot of times I say, I don't care. Yes. Like just like leave me wherever, and then I'll. Sometimes I say that, but as I've done this more and more as a headliner, like I kind of, when I walk in, I know where I want to go, and I'll start loading tracks in the genre that I want to play when I start. Yeah. So, so I have been saying more so to the openers, like, "Hey, I'm going to come in with this track at this BPM. So, you know, two or three songs before you're done, please leave me in that." It's actually area. something I'm going to think probably more about for this coming Saturday. Cause it's, a, I don't have a lot of like headline sets where I do deal with openers, but like, like I said, a lot of the times when I do, like, I really don't mind where they leave me, but that's personal preference. You yeah. don't know, you don't know how uh, the headliner is going to react when, when, uh, when they walk in. So I think that's, that's number one, just ask them, extend that courtesy. Like I said, and um, I, I just not burning any really huge tracks in that last 20 minutes to 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, because that's just a great way to just piss off the, the headliner and 
another way to sour a, a potential relationship. A smart technique that I started using when I was playing with like the bigger acts in Atlantic City would be that last like 15 minutes before the headliner goes on. If I know it's a hard midnight, let's say at 1145, I'm going to take the energy back one tick. And I'm also not playing anything that's relatively new. Like we're going throwbacks at that point, whether it's house music or hip hop or whatever the case may be. Uh, I'm, I'm pulling it back a little bit. I, I just think that when you think about the overall flow of the night, you want to just pull back a tad. So when the headliner comes on, it creates that big headliner start of the night. Right. Uh, and I think that's really important. So that's just another little technique. Yeah, I like that. I was going to ask you because you've opened for a bunch of like really big acts. Like, how does that? Because you've you've made a you, you started your career opening for like local bigger acts as headliners, and now you're uh, opening for like nationally headlining um, acts. So, like, is there a differentiation between the two? Um, yeah, I think oftentimes when you're opening your local club, like your hometown clubs. Um, you probably know the headliner or at least know have heard them play before or right. you know what they're going to play. Many times, you know, if I'm opening for a big act, I have to go do my homework as far as, all right, well, I just played for Cheat Codes. What does Cheat Codes last like 10 sets on 1001 track list look like? Maybe there are songs that I would think that they wouldn't play that they are playing. So I really go and do that. But I think also it's like, you could play more your style when you're opening for a big act like that because it is such high energy. You're usually like in a big venue or a big casino, and it's like, I can play a bunch of cream edits. I can right. play a cream original music, and I know they're not going to play that stuff because it's my own stuff. Do you find that when you're playing those sets and you're doing an op open close thing that you're going to do more your artist set pre and then post, you're going to just feed off of kind of what they didn't play? Okay, I can Post, play. I'm going to play a headliner set. Right. I'm playing the cream post artist headliner set for sure. That's cream on the stage, on the mic, big intro when they're done, like the whole nine yards, because most of the time those headliners are playing a two hour or hour and a half, you know, 12 to two, one to three type thing. And you, you have time at the back end to really show what you could do. I think that's great advice. I would never think about about it in that way where, okay, now I could come and present myself as the artist. Um, it's a great way to have the, the people who make the decisions in the room kind of ears perk up and, and kind of notice you for who you are as a DJ. I think that's really important. Yeah, I mean, I used to do this in New York City all, all the time because I would open and close and New York City closes at four. So the headliner would play 12 to two or 2.30 and then I'd have that back end to show what I could do and really have the crowd. They're drunk, they're energized, you know, they just saw the headliner play and were rocking out. So you could just feed off that energy and fill gaps, right? Yeah. I think when you're playing a local set, you're filling gaps. What didn't they play? Where? What can I hit right now? What big records did they miss? I have a particular set that I opened for Beat Breaker, and he played a completely different set than I thought he was going to play. I think it was kind of he was transitioning over more to like a not EDM, but like more dance music than the Beat Breaker like hip hop DJ that that we knew about. And he was transitioning over it, and I found myself getting to play every big hip-hop song that was out at the time. So, yeah, it is coming in and filling those gaps and just being able to – just be, be, being able to be versatile, Yeah. right? And, and I think that you have to have a really open mind and really pay attention to what – when you're closing this is. Really pay attention to what the headliner played so they, that you can fill in the stuff that they did not play. Yeah, and if you're if you're an opener and you're set to just play the open set, make sure you're prepared to play longer than your your set time. You know, maybe the the headliner's flying in and their flight got delayed or they missed their flight, and now it's your opportunity to show what you got as a headliner. the The venue is going to rely on you to play until the headliner's there and they're ready to go. So whether they're late or they're not going to be there at all, then it's your opportunity to take a step because if you do a good job as the headliner, they might say, "Hey, Kareem, hey, Gary." You did an amazing job when XYZ G DJ didn't show up. So let's give you one Friday a month. Or we'll give you the holiday weekends when it's a little slower and you get a taste of being a headliner type yeah. thing. And then you work your way through the, through the ranks at that venue. Yeah. A couple other things. I, I think we talked a lot about uh, what you need to do when you're actually in the, in the set. But some of the things you could do when you're not actually DJing. Uh, before your set, right, you want to get there super early. When you get there... You want to say hello to every single person, especially if you've never played there. The security guards, the door person, the bartenders, the bottle girls. You know, you want to try and 
handshake with the manager. Ask, hey, is the manager, if you know the person's name, ask for them specifically. If you don't know their name, ask a bartender, hey, who's the manager? Can you point them out to me? And stick around till you actually get to shake that person's hand and say like, hey, thank you guys for having me. Is there anything you want me to focus on? Do we have any big spenders in the room? Some of those questions that you can ask a manager that lets them know, hey, this person knows what they're doing. They've been here before. They know some of the things that are important to us, the venue, that they're already thinking about before they even started playing. I think that serves multiple purposes. First of all, I think it's, like you said, to make sure that the the, the important people in the room know that they're comfortable with you. They're comfortable with knowing that you know what you're doing. You know, you're, like you said, asking all the right questions. But then on the reverse side of it, I feel like it also makes you a little more comfortable, especially in a place that you're not, you're not familiar with. Yeah. I think just really establishing a relationship with one or two of the people in the room, there's just a comfort, there's a comfortability behind that. So that when you do step into the, uh, in, in, into the booth, that, that nervous tension kind of releases a little bit because you, you do ha- have, have now somebody in the room that you you've earn talked yourself to. a little leeway with your set. Also, if you're, if you're straying off a little bit and you don't have that open conversation in the very beginning, that manager is going to rush up to the booth, freaking out. It's going to mess you up. Whereas if you already had that conversation, maybe they give you some information as far as what they want you to play. Number one, and what they want you to stay away from, which is even more important, but They'll just come up and be like, hey, Kareem, uh, you know, maybe just get back to hip hop. And, you know, you played a great hip hop set earlier. Like, just get back to that. Let's stay there instead of coming up there and freaking out because you hadn't had a conversation with them already. Yeah. My, like my nerves in new venues are it's still to this day just astronomical. So, like, it, I have to figure out those ways before my set, before I even step foot in the booth to make me calm down a little bit, to make me feel a little more comfortable. And that is definitely one of the ways I do it is. Maybe like, and it's usually like I try to have like a four or five minute conversation with the manager yeah. just to really establish that rapport, to put him at ease. And then also, you know, more importantly to me, to put me at ease. Right. And a lot, another technique is if you know you're playing a venue and you're friends with someone who plays there regularly, hit them up beforehand and say, Hey, what works here? What is the staff like? What, what do they expect? And then when you're having that conversation, be like, Oh, I talked to Gary. He told me that this usually works here. Right. And that could either confirm or deny like what your plan for the set is. And again, it's like, oh, this person knows Gary. So if he's playing places that Gary's playing, he's probably pretty good. Right. That was, that was a get down was built on that MO, right? We used to just hit hit up everybody before we walked into a new place just to get the the vibe and the feel of the place. And I still do that. Yeah. To this day, I still do that. If I'm headlining somewhere out and I saw that Beatbreaker was playing there last week, be like, yo, I saw you just played at this place. How'd it go? What did you play? Yeah. What really worked? It, it's just extra information that you could use to your advantage. And the more information and the more comfortable you feel going into a set, the better you're probably going to do. Yeah, for sure. Another thing, uh, if you're getting drinks, especially when you first start at a venue, the first couple times you're there, if you get a drink, offer to pay for it. If they say no, whatever money you were just going to hand them, give them as a tip, probably a $20 bill. Yeah. That's just one of those things where it's like at the end of the night, Maybe the, maybe your set was okay, but if you do that, that person's going to remember. You're like, oh, I really liked Cream. They did a good job. Or I really like Gary. Like, this is just like the personal side of things. It's that per- it's it's having a personality and, and establishing that rapport with with the bartenders. It it goes such a long way. Like you, you can't that twenty bucks is nothing at the end of the day when maybe you had like two or three bad songs that maybe that bartender wouldn't have liked. Well, yeah. they're going to have forgotten about that, right? Because oh, he was such a nice guy. You know, it, it, you hear it time and time again. It's like, I, re- I really like that DJ as a person. And you don't really hear. And then oftentimes you're not hearing much about what they're doing technically. It's, it's all about, you know, having that relationship. Right. Uh, your music is the most important thing, right? What you play, how you play it. Are you clean? Is the crowd into it? Is the bar making money? But all the personal stuff on the back end will get you rehired. Right. You know, that's the stuff they'll be like, if your set was middle of the road, if they like you as a person and you do all the right things on the, on the front and back end of your set, it's going to help you get booked again because people feel comfortable working with you and they understand you understand the industry and that stuff goes a long way. This is like those unspoken rules type thing we were talking about with Ferrari, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Anything else as far as being an opener that you would throw out there? <sighs> We've covered a lot. What about, what, what about, we'll talk about this real quick. What about, uh, like, the money and and what where it makes sense to open for less than you would normally take or for no money sometimes. I think 
do you know who the headliner is, or is it just you? You just know the venue that you're. It's the big play. venue in in town that you want to work at, in the city that you want to work at. I I think if if it's if it's where if it's the big venue in town somewhere that you want to work, you do walk in there and you do take less money. Do you play for free? I don't know. That that's something that we always go back and forth on. What if you're a brand new DJ? I'd say then that then at m- maybe the first time, yeah, you can go in and offer your services for free. Um, and then establish all of those relationships, do all those things that we just spoke about. And then next time it's be like, okay, well, I, I, I did you guys a favor the first time, you know, I did all the right things. Yeah. You don't have to say that you're not, you're never going to really say that, but you, as long as you've done all those right things, you've now earned the right to ask for money the next time. Right. I think the approach is if it's a venue that you desperately want to get into, you go and do it and you do the best possible job that you can do so that they ask you back. When they ask you back, you say, hey, I did the first one for free or for less money. You know, if you thought I did a really good job, like this is the amount of dollars that I normally make as a DJ. Can we work something out that's closer to that? Or can we can we get my rate or however you negotiate it? But I think if it's somewhere you really want to work, you just go do it, whatever it is. We, we've seen more often than not that when you get put in those positions where you might be asked to play for free on a Saturday night, that and you do a good job and you do all these things that maybe if the venue's thrown maybe a Thursday party, maybe you're the first person they call and be like, okay, well, you brought you brought a bunch of your friends out. Right. Uh, we're trying to build a Thursday. Maybe, you know, we feel like you'd be a great fit for that. Sometimes there's a benefit in not taking the money and there's a long-term benefit in making other money at that venue that maybe not be that Saturday. Night. Right. It's, it's really like how you look at the gig, right? Is this just a one and done thing where you're just going to go make money? Then no, you're not going to do it for less than your price. Right. But if it's a venue or a hospitality group that maybe owns three other venues and you know that if you do a good job and you get in with this group, you could potentially be booking one gig a week or whatever. Then I think you just do whatever you need to do to make a really good impression. And then you negotiate on the back end once you've shown that you can do the job. Yeah, the, 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 it's all strategic and, and it's all going to be dependent upon the, the venue and, and the restaurant group or you know, yeah. nightlife group. So I think one final thing that I'll throw out there uh, would just be if you're an opener and you're playing bigger at some bigger venues, I would say just learn how to DJ with the USB stick. Yeah, uh, It's just something that's good to be able to do. A lot of times these big artists will require it. I've yeah. had artists who have said, the reason why I switched over to using a USB when I'm opening for big artists was because I don't remember who it was, but it was literally in the rider that the, the opening DJ has to be on USBs at least 15 minutes prior to the start of the headliner set. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, you can switch out of it from your computer, the but why do it? The first time I did it, and then from there on out, I was like, all right, I'm using USBs for any of these big yeah. sets. I also think that for the bigger sets, it just makes you look like a bigger act right an artist if you are playing in that way with the three thousands it makes it really a lot easier these days yeah, than, I mean, I've been than playing it ever format was sets on sticks it's like yeah it's amazing it's pretty amazing it's right so all right so i think that i mean that covers a lot yeah <laughs> covers a lot i know we just spent a lot of time on all this stuff around being an opener but it's because it is so important and it's because oftentimes younger djs you guys don't know this stuff and this is the stuff that's going to get you working and get you playing more in these venues and working with the right people. So take note of this stuff. Cause it's going to, it makes a difference. Gary and I book a lot of DJs. Like these are all the things that we look for in, yeah. in working with new talent, you know? Yeah. We, when you're a younger up and coming DJ, the aspiration isn't to play in the bar, right? It's to play in the major nightclubs in your market. And in those major nightclubs, you're going to have an opener in a hundred percent of the situations, right? So knowing this stuff is invaluable to, to growing your brand and, and just growing your DJ career you know, at a young age. Yeah. All right. So let's transition to our next topic. This, this might (laughs) hurt some feelings. And if we hurt your feelings, we apologize ahead of time, but we got to talk about the blue checks. So Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, I guess have rolled out, uh, you know, this pay to play blue check thing. Um, I think Instagram's like $15 a month and Twitter's $8 a month. And it basically verifies you as, DJ Cream or DJ Gary W or whoever. Uh, and it's been a hot topic. It's like, I, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think about the blue check and what are you hearing about it? My initial thought was genius move on Instagram, and Instagram and uh, Twitter's part, right? Like the, the first 24 hours, what was it? $660 million, I believe, was the number, right? In the first 24 hours when Instagram rolled this out. Genius move uh, on, their, on their part. 
Um, and then I felt like for businesses um, and artists, I feel like there is some kind of validation in it. I don't feel like the everyday person needs it for what I, I, I don't really understand that. Right. But from a, from a business standpoint uh, and a, or an artist standpoint, like, I kind of understand it, but at the same time, I'm finding myself seeing it, seeing a blue check and being like, well, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So I, I feel like my initial thought was, okay, good idea. Good idea for a business to have a blue check. As I started to see them come across my feed, I, I don't feel like it does anything. It does anything. Like I'm, I'm just like, oh, whatever. That person just bought it. You know what I mean? I think I get it from a business standpoint. They were like, oh, well, we have all these corporations and famous celebrities who are just like getting these blue checks for free. So let's just charge them. It's a mon it's a nominal amount of money for them that they don't really, it's not no sweat off their back. They're all going to pay and it's just instant revenue for us. Right. So that part of it, I get, but you're right on the trickle down effect. It's like when I would see blue checks in my Instagram feed, let's say as far as like people that were liking or commenting my stuff. I always was way more likely to be like, well, who's that? Let right. me go see who this is. Maybe I should be following this person. Uh, and I still do that. But now because Instagram puts the person's full name, if they've paid for their thing, it's like, oh, well, this person only has 3000 followers and it, their full name is there. And I know they didn't get this prior to like the blue check rollout. It's like, it doesn't mean as much to me, but it still got me to go click on their profile, which I think is valuable in some way. It's funny. It's funny that you have that you'll still go check it out. And I'm just like, I'll blow it off now. Right. You See, know, I'll, I, go, I'll still go look at it. I still have this horrendous jaded New Yorker mentality sometimes where I'm like, well, all right, whatever. That's like, well, I think a lot of people are going to have your mentality to be quite honest, where it's like, oh, the blue check marks don't even matter anymore. Cause it's like anybody could have them type thing. Right. Right. I kind of hate that it did that. Yeah. What would be some of the pros though? Like let's say for cream, right? If I were to pay, like it gives me my my blue check mark. I don't have ten thousand followers. I have like eight thousand or whatever. Does it give me more credibility? Does it like? I guess with Instagram, like I'm giving them my my ID and they're validating me as the person who is cream, and no one else can be cream with the blue check mark. So like, there can't there won't be a fake account with DJ Cream NYC or or is that is that yeah, I mean, still I viable? That's, that's part of it, but like. I don't know. In my, all my days, I think I only had one time where someone tried to make a profile with me. Yeah. I, I just wonder, like, if that's like, not famous enough. For that. Like, if that's know, protecting that. Man. Right. If, if that's protecting that in a way, like just in case, you know, you did blow up as an artist or, or as a podcaster or something like that. Yeah. Like, if that's protecting that, then OK, I kind of understand that. If it's protecting your brand, your company's brand. OK, I, I kind of understand that. But. I, I feel like I would need Instagram to sit down and like really sell this to me. Yeah, I don't I don't see what the what's the allure. I, I don't know what what is it what does it get you the individual DJ? That's what I don't fully understand. Other than maybe DJ Cream will click on your profile if you like my stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. Like is that what it is? It's just the potential to for people to look at your page and be more interested in working with you, maybe? Yeah, possibly. I mean I I don't like that it's cheapened the effect in such a short period of time. Right. I feel like you should have to have 10,000 followers still. Easily. To be able to pay to buy it and pay for it. Easily. There's got to be a threshold to come in on. Yeah. But on the business side of things, if Cream and Gary W. owned Instagram, we'd be all about selling as many as you can. It doesn't matter. Well, let's, let's talk about it from a get down. DJ. We're going to have this conversation live on air. We haven't even talked <laughs> about this. From a get down DJ standpoint, does it make sense for us to pay for the blue check? We're a, we're a business, right? We're trying to attract clientele that's not just nightlife, right? It's it's corporate and it's hospitality groups and it's all these different people. Does it make sense for us to pay them monthly to get the blue check? I think I understand it more, like I said, from a business owner's standpoint, right? right? Like if I owned a brick not and mortar individual. or whatever, not the individual as much. There are other get down DJ groups, so maybe it would make sense for us to pay the money and be like, we are the get down DJ group. Right. If you want to book, you know, entertainment in in the tri state, that New York City and regional East Coast. It's kind of funny we're talking about talking this out, but yeah, it might it <laughs> might actually make sense to do that. Maybe we're gonna have a blue check on the get down page coming soon. By the time this comes out, we're gonna have a blue check on Instagram. But I I, I do understand it from a business side. I just from a personal side, it's it just. Especially, I don't know. I see some of the guys who who have gotten them, and I, and I understand it. But 
you know, I just don't, I don't think it validates anything more like, further, you know? Right. I'm not more, or I'm not more likely to book you because you have the blue check. Exactly. And I think at the end of the day, as DJs, like, that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to book more gigs. That's why we have this podcast. We want you guys to try and book more gigs. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just really personally uh, kind of back and forth. With I think it. people are like hating on some of the people that get the blue check. I, I, I don't like, have that. We're kind all of time. like, listen, we're, <laughs> the DJ world's a bunch of haters. So like somebody's going to hate on you for first for whatever you do. I got that kind of time to be hating on people. Not, get blue well, I'm checks. Saying you, but I'm but, just saying in general, the industry as a whole, it's, it's, it's wild though. Like, like, I see it on what? Twitter. Like, yeah, but like for what? Like, all right, if that's, if somebody needs to feel a little more validated by paying money per, per month to Instagram, so be it. Yeah. You know, if it makes them feel better about their brand and what their Instagram page looks like, like we always talk about, we've, we've nailed, we, we, we've nailed this into people's heads forever that like how important your, the look of your Instagram page is. If, if somebody thinks that putting a blue check on their page really makes that page stand out more then maybe it's worth it to them. Yeah. You know, it's worth it more to some people than, than to others. Like, and, and that's okay. Everybody has different perspectives. Um, I think that's a great way to leave it is just like, if you think it helps you, then do it. Right. If you think it's going to help you book more gigs, do it or sell more records or, you know, get more views, do it. Maybe, maybe having a more in-depth conversation with somebody who is on that side of the fence would be a good thing for the show. Just even if it's just like a little 10 minute segment, because it, I, I'd really like to hear the, the other side of it from a personal perspective outside of being a business. I a, think being a business. A little bit of a side note, and I think this pay to play model that that Instagram and Twitter are now rolling out here, we're seeing some of these bigger news outlets and the Washington Nationals move away from being so active on Twitter. Some of the like, you know, NPR, you can only go now to NPR to get their news, not they're not live streaming on Twitter. The Washington Nationals used to lo literally tweet the play by play or inning by inning on their Twitter, and they now said, "Hey, we're not doing it on here anymore. Come to our website. So I think this is might be creating a little shift in the market where websites are going to become way more important. Uh, and we've been talking about this a little bit and seeing it a little bit, but I think this is going to help push it even further where people are going to be moving away from the social media sites to their own platform where they own their content and the website's not getting shut down. Twitter can get shut down tomorrow. Right. The government could come in and say, hey, TikTok's not a thing anymore and you could lose all your followers and everything that you have on there. So... I think for us as DJs and producers, I think it's important to, to think about, is it now the time to kind of go back and maybe start putting all of my content on my website instead of a link tree or Instagram or whatever? We just redid the Get Down website. Yeah. And all of our content is now on the Get Down website. You're going to see our, we're not going to have a link tree in our, in our Instagram profile anymore. It's just going to be our website and everything is going to be there. I, I think it's interesting because like with, what what some people feel like regulation within those within those sites, you know, and, and, and algorithms and who you follow and what you see, it's becoming I don't, it's 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 hard for me to see some of the people that I follow's content. You know, yeah. I have to like actually go seek out some of this stuff in order to just get their content across my feed. It's I'm getting more non followed material than I or content than I than I ever have been at this yeah. point. So it makes sense for people to drive more traffic to their websites because this way they can see all of your content. There's never going to be anything missed, especially for like a company like ours. If there's podcasts, there's mixes, there's, um, you know, ways to book us. There's right, just the a roster, multitude of things, a multitude of things. Like it makes more sense to drive all, all that traffic to the website so that you can really intake everything. Yeah, like if DJs hit us up, we can now send people directly to the website to, you know, give us some information about who you are as a DJ. I had a private event. Somebody hit me up for a private event this morning, and I finally was able to drive them back to the website. It felt good to do that and not have to drive them to the Instagram. To it's my Instagram. kind of nice. It's really, it's, I think it presents on a pr private event standpoint, more professional. I think it's just like across the board, more professional to, to, to send people, potential clients to your website. All right. Not just here. So I brought up the website because I wanted to plug the Get Down Meetup. I wanted you guys to know about the website. Number one, it's fully redesigned. All of our content you can now find on the website, including this podcast, whether you want to watch it uh, or listen to it. Like Gary said, the Get Down Radio, you know, everything we do, our merch, Get Down University, anything that we do as a company is now on our website, getdowndjgroup.com. And you guys, have, we, we, we teased the Get Down Meetup, but 
If you guys want to come to the Get Down Meetup, it's Wednesday, May 17th from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. at Corgi Distillery in uh, Jersey, Jersey City. City. And if it's RSVP only. You have to have a ticket. Tickets are free. If you want a ticket, go to our website, and right on the homepage, you can RSVP for the event. Again, it's getdowndjgroup.com. You can find it on any of our, our social links as well. Uh, RSVP, we only have 200, and 200 or 250 tickets available. Last year, we did 200 tickets in like four days. Yeah. So if you want to come to the event, make sure you go RSVP and get a ticket. Yeah, it's just a super dope event, guys. If you didn't come last year, there's two rooms. We're going to be doing the Pariah Production Academy. Um, he's going to go over how to build a yep, track, live, I believe. Yeah, breakdown of one of his tracks. We're going to have DJs in the other, in the main room, and then outside we'll have a food truck. There's a whole outside area with, like, outdoor games and whatnot. So, you know, it, it's it's a nice spread out event where you have different pockets of, of uh, places where you can network with people, yeah. which is nice. You can be completely involved in the in the uh, learning portion of it in the side room you could be involved in the you know where the djs are playing or you could step outside and, and go grab a bite to eat and sit down with whoever you're you're talking with there's gonna be more decision makers and more djs and artists in this room than probably any other networking event that you could go to this year besides like miami music week right <laughs> right at least locally this is gonna be you know it's it's always been a really successful event for us it's great for gary and i to kind of put faces with names and get to talk to some people that have hit us up on socials uh and i think it's really great for djs that don't work with us to get to meet with some of the djs that do work with us and kind of have that back and forth and so much has come out of our, our meetups in the past and it's one of the most important things we do and it's a lot of work yeah <laughs> It's great though. I, I always always walk out of there invigorated. It's kind of the same feeling I get when we leave Miami after you know talking to so many people, and and I, I just feel like doing this you know a month and a half after Miami. It's just a, a good way to just keep the ball rolling yep. with with meeting new people. Yeah, guys. So go RSVP, uh, and we look forward to that next month. We'll we'll be promoing this throughout the next yeah, few weeks. For sure. All right. So final topic. Uh, we're gonna talk Coachella. I think. Um, you know, I think a while back we kind of compared the Coachella lineup to the Bonnaroo lineup, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's now interesting to see the event happen. Obviously, my timelines and my For You pages everywhere have been, like, all Coachella for two weeks. Uh, you know, a little FOMO here for not being one to go take it. <laughs> Gary was like, man, we should go to a festival. We haven't been to one in a while. I haven't been to a festival probably, like, a, a big festival like that. I think it's been, like, 10 or 12 years-ish. The last Bonnaroo I went to was, like, 2011. But, I, you know— it, because of that festival turning so pop and becoming more Coachella esque, yeah, uh, I lost interest in it. But I know for a fact that the production value over the last ten years has gotten so insane that I would love to just go see it, even if it's just for a day or two, just to see kind of how the things have how things have changed, and like also to think about almost how to integrate some of these entertainment aspects into the nightlife culture. I think that that's really important. Young people are, are flocking to all these festivals. There's a reason there's a million festivals that have, that have popped up. You know, when, when we were younger, there was only – there was the two main ones, right? There was – well, Bonner wasn't even really a thing. Coachella was still pretty big. That and Burning Man were, were two two major ones. Coachella's from when? That, like, 99? Yeah, they both popped up around the like same 90s, time. 90s, early 2000s. Or, whereas, like, Bonner started as, like, a hippie festival, and Coachella was still doing, like, more, like, indie – indie rock and then they kind of integrated some pop and whatnot in there as well and, and like dj sets where then they both kind of became a similar thing yeah um but i think coachella does a really good job at like marketing what what they're all about and really as like you said before being tastemakers in the music industry yeah i mean they had every all the big acts that we've talked about in the last year were mostly all at coachella you know yeah I, I thought it was really interesting to to see it play out and and just see some of the videos coming through and like obviously we talked about Skrillex and Fortet and Fred again and Bad Bunny and who else? So it's we, incredible I mean, weekend, that even even though that it's incredible that those three got the call like last minute to go cover the second weekend and I I truly believe that's all pig this is all piggybacked on all of the stuff that they've been doing. Um, it just goes to show you even at the highest point of 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 uh entertainment that like staying consistent really is is important so like it's not just like on an up-and-coming dj or producer perspective where be consistent be consistent with with your work like it even happens at the highest level um 
they they the Coachella Festival, like as like we said, is sort of like a tastemaker, but it's it's all different genres. It's acts from it's Blink One Eighty Two and it's you know yeah. Bad Bunny and it's, Bjork was a really Bjork you know was a Ch- fucking headline. Chemical Brothers was was a was supposedly a, a highlight of the weekend. Their their stage show looked dope. It looked yeah. really really cool. I think it's really interesting that we're seeing the stage show really be something that people are like interested in with uh eric prids we were just talking about tale of us right tale of us like i want to go to this like shows. elevated yeah. visuals that go along with all of the music which just creates more of an experience for for us as fans which is really really cool the the experience driven shows are obviously being attended to more than not right so right. like it, yeah like tale of us is constantly on my feed and I, wa- I I find myself like mesmerized watching it just on my phone. I can't yeah. imagine what it would be like in person. Right? In person, probably a little tuned up. Probably like <laughs> I don't want to get into the extracurriculars, <laughs> but oh man. Um, but yeah, like Blink One Eighty Two was probably was was a highlight, right? Uh, what well, went down with Frank Ocean exactly? I saw it come across my feed that like he wasn't playing, but right. Th- th- so he was supposed to be a headliner right he had this like elaborate like ice skating rink thing set up with all these skaters um and i guess his initial set he started super late and when he did actually perform it was like really short and weird and then he did like a dj set where i heard him playing like knock two and like it was oh geez it was like bizarre okay uh and i guess the fallout of that was like we're not gonna have frank ocean and and they had you know the Blink 182s and the and the Fred against Skrillex Fortet kind of cover the second weekend. It's really it it was reminiscent of um, I was at the Bonner where uh, Kanye had an elaborate set uh, set and he was playing I think it was one a.m. and we we stayed there the whole day at the main stage because it was um, oh my goodness I'm gonna blank Jack Johnson Pearl Jam and somebody really really random a random blues. I can't think of it offhand. And then Kanye was after that. So I was like, okay, this is perfect. I get a little bit of everything yeah. over the next five and hours. Post up. Sat there. Kanye, one o'clock rolls around, he doesn't show up. Two o'clock rolls around, he doesn't show up. Three o'clock rolls around, he doesn't show up. He didn't start till the sun came up because I think that he wanted to come out to good morning. And it was like people were just throwing stuff at him. It was real. It was, and it was like the beginning of, I don't want to say the end, but the beginning of that, like, Kanye, Kanye like a spin yeah free fall yeah so to speak yeah it was wild so it was kind of reminiscent of that where it was this elaborate setup that kind of it doesn't always translate at a, as, as yeah. at a festival because you have such high turnarounds so i was looking through uh some of like the biggest festivals that take place in the u.s coachella's two hundred fifty thousand people Jeez. uh lollapalooza new york's 170 artists three hundred eighty five thousand people edc las vegas 450,000 people. Uh, the other big one, New Orleans Jazz Fest, 450,000 people. I'm going next week. It's going to be go. great. South by Southwest, 230. Austin City Limits, 450. Life is Beautiful, Vegas, 180. Rolling Loud, 80,000. Ultra, 170. I think it's interesting because those are all like a little different festivals. The biggest ones kind of have a mixture of all music, right? It's yeah. pop music. It's hip hop. It's EDM. It's and I think we're seeing more of those like multi-genre festivals happen. It's just it's it's a product of the times. It's a product of of people just nobody's just a hip hop fan anymore. Nobody's just a house fan. I don't say nobody, but like predominantly, people are listening to all types of genres. So it's it's I feel like these festivals have driven that though too. Not only you know the Spotify culture and the Apple Music culture, but also these festivals have made people just like to get into several different. Genres. I mean, when I went to my first Bonnaroo back in like oh four, it was like I got to see Dave Matthews Band, Tiesto, My Morning Jacket, and like you know, I think Stephanie Stevens, who's like a folk artist. So like I got to see a little bit of everything. Yeah, like, really, really and, eclectic. And it and it makes you become a fan of all of, all of these different genres, and it has propelled the popularity of of the music festival for sure. Um, I speaking think, of music festivals, real yeah. quick, we got to plug it. Because half of the DJ group, get down DJ group uh, guys are playing uh, Bamboozle. Yeah, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing to plug it, but <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there's been a lot of like, uh, I don't know, noise about the Bamboozle Festival. But our DJs are playing the entire weekend, uh, playing with artists like Steve Aoki. Uh, who, the, who are some of the other, other headliners? I know they've changed over the course of the last month right. or so, but. 
yeah, that that part of it's a little fluid, but I, I think that, you know, just letting people know that our guys are going to be there. In case you guys are uh, attending the festival, go check our guys out. Yeah, for sure. They're going to be playing all types of different genres. There's been a lot of talk around, like, Ooh, what should I play? And I've talked to two different DJs asking me what they should play. And yeah. it's just like kind of play, play your artist set. Play what you like, you know? It's going to be a really cool experience for them because they, they I'm sure none of them have ever played in front of the, as many people that are going to be in front of them or on a stage as big as that. Right, right. And like Harris Pool is kind of like a bigger stage, but right. not, 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 not festival, festival stage. Yeah, that's for sure. So but. shout to all those guys that are playing Bamboozle. That's what, next weekend, right? That is going to be May, week of May 5th. 5th? Yep. Yeah, yeah, next weekend. So that'll be dope. But all right, guys, I think it's a good point to wrap. For sure. Uh, again, if you guys want to RSVP to the Get Down Meetup, Wednesday, May 17th, go to our website, getdowndjgroup.com, RSVP there. There are limited tickets, and you have to have a ticket to get in. They're free. So just go RSVP. We'll see you guys next week. All right, guys. Peace out. Peace.